Hey friends, Elizabeth here from Plant Based Bride and welcome to my first video of 2021. Today I'm super excited to be going through all the books I read in December of 2020 and giving you my quick thoughts and impressions and I'm also going to share with you my plans for reading in January. So I hope you're excited for this one and I'm going to keep this intro super short because I have a lot of books to get through and I don't want this video to be two hours long. So let's just get right into it. As always, I'm going to go through the books in the order that I finished them. So the first book I read in December was Pet by Kweki Amezi. There are no more monsters, or so the children in the city of Lucille are taught. With doting parents and a best friend named Redemption, Jam has grown up with this lesson all her life. But when she meets Pet, a creature made of horns and colors and claws, who emerges from one of her mother's paintings and a drop of Jam's blood, she must reconsider what she's been told. Pet has come to haunt a monster, and the shadow of something grim lurks in Redemption's house. Jam must fight not only to protect her best friend, but also to uncover the truth and to answer the question, how do you save the world from monsters if no one will admit they exist? And I gave Pet five stars. I thought this was really well done. This was Akweki Amezi's debut young adult novel. So I read one of Akweki Amezi's works earlier in the year. I read Freshwater, which unfortunately really didn't work for me. It was one of my few one-star reads of the year. You can see my full review on Goodreads. As always, my Goodreads is linked down below. But I was a bit hesitant going into Pet. It was something that I put on my TBR before I read Freshwater. And after I read Freshwater, I got a little scared that Pet would similarly not work for me. But I was very pleasantly surprised. I will say that part of why Freshwater didn't work for me was how much intense, dark content was included and how it was handled. And I will say that Pet also has that very dark subject matter. So I'd highly recommend checking content warnings before jumping into this one. As always, I've included all of the content or trigger warnings that I can think of on the book cards in this video to try to help you out, though it's possible that I'll miss some. But this is a very intense read. Um, it made me very uncomfortable. It made me very angry and sad. But despite that dark content that was really difficult to read, it is simultaneously really beautiful. And I think it's an empowering read for young people. It really has this message of believing children and young adults in standing behind them, in empowering them to be able to stand up for themselves and fight for themselves and reach out for help when they need it, which I think is a really important message that young people everywhere should be exposed to. I also loved that Jam, our protagonist, is trans. She is fully herself and her parents accept her without reservation and so do her friends and so does her community. And that's really beautiful to read as well, that her trans experience, while it does tie into her character and does come up within the novel, it's not a source of pain in her life, which is really nice to read. So I'd highly recommend this one. It definitely does read a little young. I would say it sort of sits somewhere between middle grade and young adult. But I do think even for adults, this is a worthwhile read and I would highly recommend it. Again, with a caveat that you check content and trigger warnings before jumping in to make sure that you're in a place that you can handle the content. The next book I read in December, I read on a whim. It was something I'd requested for my library and it popped up and I thought, hey, why not? It's an audiobook. I'll just listen to this over the next couple days and hopefully I love it. And that book is City of Girls by Elizabeth Gilbert. In 1940, 19-year-old Vivian Morris has just been kicked out of Vassar College. Her affluent parents send her to Manhattan to live with her Aunt Peg, who owns a flamboyant, crumbling midtown theater called the Lily Playhouse. There, Vivian is introduced to an entire cosmos of unconventional and charismatic characters, from the fun-chasing showgirls to a sexy male actor, a grand dame actress, a lady killer writer, and no-nonsense stage manager. But when Vivian makes a personal mistake that results in professional scandal, it turns her new world upside down in ways that will take her years to fully understand. And unfortunately, this book did not do it for me. I was so sad. I mean, for those of you who know, I went to school for musical theater. I am a musical theater nerd. I worked professionally in musical theater all through my 20s, and I'm a big lover of the classics. I'm a big lover of the golden age of musical theater. I adore 1930s, 1940s, 1950s musicals. It's just so glittery and uplifting and optimistic and nostalgic for me. Some of my favorite musicals I've ever been in have been those old school style musicals where I get to be a showgirl and there's just just so many good memories with that type of musical theater. It really is my jam. So I was really excited to read this book. I was honestly kind of hoping it would fill the void that has been my lack 
of being able to perform or see live performance during all of 2020. And unfortunately, it just wasn't that for me. It really didn't focus very much on the theater itself, which was definitely not the impression I got from the synopsis. And sadly, I just felt like the story didn't really go anywhere. It was quite repetitive. It was quite slow. There were glimmers of interesting things happening that I enjoyed, and there were a couple characters that I found really intriguing. But basically, the first entire half of the novel felt like a really slow setup for the second half. And the second half seemed to be where the heart of the novel resided, but it was given such a short amount of time to fully develop compared to the really slow first half, which ended up not really having a huge amount of sway in the end and clearly wasn't the main focus of the novel, even though, again, that part of the novel was really what was emphasized in the way this book was marketed. I also didn't click with the style of the writing. It felt almost like reading a summary um, or an early draft, a bunch of bullet notes that the author had written about things they wanted to happen or things they wanted to cover without really feeling like those points were actually delved into or explored in detail. We just sort of glossed over everything, which didn't particularly work for me. There was also some questionable stuff in there when it comes to sexual assault and consent and a physical assault that was sort of weirdly glossed over and made light of, which didn't sit well with me. Not that I think that fictional stories should be sex education, of course not. But our unfortunate reality is that a lot of people don't get adequate sex education, and you never know who may be reading these books. And I think it is important to make it very clear that even if characters brush off those risks, even if characters don't think it's a big deal, that we make it very clear to readers that sexual assault, lack of consent, physical abuse, they are a big deal and we need to be aware of them and we need to be careful. We need to protect ourselves, even if the characters within the story don't think it's a big deal or have an unhealthy relationship with those things. The next book I finished in December was Hench by Natalie Zena Walshots. A smart, imaginative, and evocative novel of love, betrayal, revenge, and redemption, told with razor-sharp wit and affection, in which a young woman discovers the greatest superpower, for good or ill, is a properly executed spreadsheet. I was so excited for this. I loved the idea of someone being a hench person for a supervillain and that their job was to handle admin tasks to, you know, do the spreadsheets handle the numbers. I loved that. I thought it was so funny and so unique. And I was really disappointed in what this book delivered. I still enjoyed the process of reading this book, and I thought it was interesting, and I thought it was funny, but it just didn't give me what it promised. This is the same problem I feel as with City of Girls, in that the way that it's marketed is not aligned with what the book actually is, and it gives you that mismatch between your expectations and what's actually delivered. So I was really excited for this character who was going to be, you know, super on board with admin work. She works in an office for the villains. She's not out in the field. She's part of the the behind-the-scenes operation of these villains, and I really wanted that story, and that's not really what we got. It turns out that while she did, in fact, have a propensity for spreadsheets, that it wasn't actually her superpower. Her superpower is something more traditional when it comes to these sorts of stories, and that her part in the organization is a lot more traditional to what we see from villains or sidekicks of villains than what I was expecting going into this. She definitely does not stay in an office. She's out in the field. She perfectly fulfills that trope of the unassuming, normal girl, boring girl, average girl who turns out to be anything but average or boring or normal and to be taken under the wing of some great either hero or in this case villain and reminded constantly how special she is and etc etc so that's not my favorite trope and I was kind of hoping that she would be the underdog throughout the book and just make everyone appreciate her because of her skills with that spreadsheet and that's not how it happened which was sad for me, especially as someone who enjoys a spreadsheet myself and is not likely to ever be one to be out in the field doing these big, risky, heroic acts. That's just not me. I was promised a protagonist kind of like me, and then that was stolen away from me. (laughs) So that was kind of upsetting. I liked the writing style. It made me laugh. There was one phrase 
that y'all I'm sure are familiar with that was used so often that I started to think that it was on purpose and that it was satire, except I'm not sure if it really was. So you know how there's that joke that a lot of young adult novels, especially maybe young adult fantasy, that there's a lot of the use of they let out the breath they didn't even know they were holding. That phrase exactly or in some variation was used a ridiculous number of times throughout this book. And again, it got to the point where I thought it was satire. I thought it was making a point and that it was supposed to be a joke, but I'm not sure that it actually was. And I will say that if the first half of the book had been kind of how the whole book went, I think this might have been a four or five star read. Unfortunately for me, the second half just didn't really fit with the first half and went in a completely different direction from what we were promised or what we expected and didn't make a lot of sense. There wasn't a lot of explanation of the motivations behind the people involved and why they were doing what they were doing. And then the ending was oddly grotesque with a really uncomfortable amount of body horror all of a sudden out of nowhere and um, a kind of odd abrupt ending. So I went through the book really enjoying it even though it wasn't exactly what I expected and then once we got in the second half everything just dissolved into chaos and I was very confused and not particularly happy with the direction things had gone all of a sudden. So I gave this book three stars but I have complex feelings about it and I think I would recommend it with the caveat that you keep in mind that the ending is kind of all over the place and prepare yourself for the random insertion of far too much body horror that just goes way too far in my opinion. At the end keep your expectations at a reasonable level and then I think you'll enjoy it maybe, hopefully. <laughs> Did that sell anyone on this? I don't know. I, I It's hard for me to talk about it because I was just very disappointed because I, I, I thought this would be my new favorite superhero tale. I'm not the biggest fan of superhero stories in general, and I thought this was going to be my jam, and it just let me down. The next book I finished in December was Plain Bad Heroines by Emily M. Danforth. A highly imaginative and original horror comedy centered around a cursed New England boarding school for girls. A wickedly whimsical celebration of the art of storytelling, sapphic love, and the rebellious female spirit. So this is another one that I was really excited about that I kind of have mixed feelings on. So I ended up giving it three stars. So this book takes place in two timelines, essentially. The past timeline focuses on Libby and Alex, who are two women who are running this school for girls and all the things that are happening at the school, mysterious deaths, so on and so forth. That past timeline has a lot of those dark academia vibes and creepy horror, very atmospheric, a lot of sapphic relationships. I really loved this past timeline. And then there's the modern day timeline, which is taking place at the same location where they are in production for a film to tell the story of this school. And we have three main characters. One is the writer of the book that this movie is based on, and then two of the main actors who are in the film and their experiences there. And the modern day timeline also has some of that creeping horror vibe. And the modern day timeline also has sapphic relationships and queer representation. I will say that the past timeline was far more interesting to me, far creepier than the modern day. I honestly wish that the entire book had taken place in the past timeline. I don't think that the modern day creation of this film really added anything to the story. And I found myself trying to hurry through the modern day section so that I could get back to the past and figure out what happened then. I was a lot more connected to Libby and Alex and the girls at the school than I ever was to the actors in the modern day. One of my biggest problems with the modern day portion of this novel was just that it didn't feel like the characters were as three-dimensional, especially Harper Harper, and yes, that's the character's name, <laughs> just felt like a cardboard cutout of a Hollywood actress and was just very uninspiring to spend time with. The other two main characters in the modern day were slightly more interesting, but were also both kind of unlikable and still not particularly well-developed. I think they just seemed more well-developed because they weren't completely one-dimensional like Harper Harper was. I also felt like the horror or creepy aspects of the modern day just weren't nearly as scary as what was happening in the older timeline. I found myself just not really getting that 
creepy, eerie vibe nearly as often with the modern timeline. Almost every scene in the past timeline was really uncomfortably full of tension and stressful, and that's kind of what you want out of a horror novel. So one more thing that really peeved me about this book. The author wrote this from the perspective of an omniscient narrator, which is fine. But the narrator, for whatever reason, uses text speak throughout. So the narrator will say TBH instead of to be honest, or will say hashtag heart eyes emoji, which why? Just why? Completely unnecessary. Felt very out of place in this novel. It honestly just read like your boomer parents trying to figure out how to use text speak and just throwing it out in the weirdest circumstances. Like imagine you show your mom something and she responds in person with, oh my gosh, hashtag heart eyes emoji. Cringe. That's what it is. Cringe. I still liked it. I think the older timeline had enough of the dark academia, mysterious, creepy, eerie, gross horror vibes to make up for everything else. I almost wish that the older timeline had been the first book and then if she wanted to write a sequel that was the retelling through the film and spent more time developing those characters and developing the eerie atmosphere that that could have worked better than trying to put it all in one book because the entire modern day timeline just felt superfluous. I did enjoy it. This was a Libro FM ALC. Libro FM is an awesome service where you can get audiobooks as an alternative to Audible and they support small bookstores. So check them out. There's a link in the description box if you want to see what Libro FM is all about. They're awesome. The next book I read in December was Over the Woodward Wall by A. Deborah Baker, and this is actually a pseudonym. This was written by Seanan McGuire, the author of Middle Game. This is a companion novel. It is a middle grade tale, excerpts of which appear in Middle Game throughout the story. And the author of Over the Woodward Wall, A. Deborah Baker, is a character within Middle Game. So it's one of those things that I only read because I enjoyed Middle Game. That was our first pick for my book club in 2020 and I really enjoyed it. I gave it five stars. So when I heard this was coming out, I knew I had to read it. And I think as a companion piece to middle game, it is worth the time. I'm not sure if this would be necessarily worth it to read to children without the context of middle game, which they shouldn't read because it's an adult book and it's very dark and not for young children. And I also don't think that any adults who haven't read middle game would necessarily get anything from this. So that's something to keep in mind. I think it was it was short and sweet. There were some really interesting characters, but nothing was particularly developed to make it really worthwhile on its own, in my opinion. But again, I will say that if you read Middle Game and enjoyed it, I think you'll enjoy this as well. It's a quick read and it does sort of add a little bit more depth to those excerpts that we get throughout the story and mirrors some of the story from Middle Game in an interesting way. I think they're a good companion read, but because it doesn't really stand on its own and because I think it left a lot to be desired, it seems like it's being set up to be a series of its own, which seems completely unnecessary to me. For that reason, I gave it three stars. I think it was enjoyable, but I think it could have been more, it could have gone deeper, and it could have been written in such a way that it could be enjoyed by children without the context of middle game, and I think it missed the mark there. The next book I finished in December was The Divines by Ellie Eaton. The girls of St. John the Divine, an elite English boarding school, were notorious for flipping their hair, harassing teachers, chasing boys, and chain-smoking cigarettes. They were fiercely loyal, sharp-tongued, and cunningly humorous in the way that only teenage girls can be. For Josephine, now in her 30s, the years at St. John were a lifetime ago. Yet now, Josephine inexplicably finds herself returning to her old stomping grounds. Ruminating on the past, Josephine becomes obsessed with her teenage identity and the forgotten girls of her one-time orbit. But the more Josephine recalls, the further her life unravels, derailing not just her marriage and career, but her entire sense of self. So this one seemed really interesting, and as soon as I read the synopsis, I requested it from NetGalley. I was really excited about it. It sounded like a cool, dark girls boarding school, dark academia, mysterious vibes. I am very into that whole setup, that whole vibe. It works for me. I enjoy it. So that's kind of what I was hoping for. And this was another one that let me down a little bit. It's another one that takes place in two timelines and yet another one where I wish we'd just stuck in the old timeline and not been in the present day because the present day storyline, other than one of the very last scenes in the modern day timeline, 
It just didn't work for me. Josephine as an adult is insufferable. She's incredibly unlikable. She is pretty one-dimensional and doesn't seem to like anyone, including her husband or her child or their dog or her mother or her friends or literally anyone else or anything else. She doesn't do very much other than describe her sex life with her husband in excruciating detail that felt very unnecessary. Yeah, so modern day Josephine, not a fan. Now, when we go back to the older timeline with Joe as a teenager, as part of the Divines, that story was a lot more interesting to me. Not to say that Joe was likable as a teen, because she certainly was not. She was still very unlikable. A bully, a coward, following the pack, not very nice. But there was just more happening in the past timeline, so I felt like there was more to bite into. It was at least more interesting. It held my attention. And I will say that as I approached maybe the halfway point, I was really questioning if I was going to be able to finish. I was also very heavily questioning what the point of this novel was. It was getting pretty frustrating because it felt like all the characters were awful. Everyone treated everyone else badly. There didn't seem to be a message. I didn't know what was supposed to be happening or who I was supposed to root for or relate to. Even the underdog characters that were supposed to, I believe, feel sympathetic for, they were also awful human beings. So I just... <laughs> was really struggling. And then we get to one of the final scenes in the modern timeline where everything flips on its head and what I thought was happening through the whole novel was not what was happening. And I can't really talk about it here because I feel like that spoils the entire book, but I will say that that scene almost completely changed my perspective on this book. It made me question a lot of the earlier portions and made me look at Joe slash Josephine in a new way and the events of the story in a new way. And it brought up some interesting questions that, again, I can't really tell you what those questions were because it kind of ruins the book. So I would recommend this if you're willing to read the majority of a book where every character is unlikable and you're just kind of irritated by how awful everyone is to get to an ending that asks some interesting questions and flips your perspective and makes you think. Is that enticing? I don't know. <laughs> I would recommend checking out Trigger and Content Warnings. As I said, most of these characters are awful people. There is a lot of ageism and homophobia and fat phobia and bullying and just general awfulness. So keep that in mind. I think the only thing I can really say is that you will enjoy this if you like reading the perspective of unlikable characters, if you enjoy getting into the mind of an awful human being and seeing how they think of themselves and how they think of others, then this would be interesting to you. If that does not sound appealing to you, I would 100% skip this because you're not going to enjoy it. For me, it was interesting, but I don't know if the ending made up for the whole beginning of the book and having no redeemable characters. So I gave it three stars. I think it was interesting but I'm not sure it's for me. The next book I finished in December was Sia Martinez and the Moonlit Beginning of Everything by Raquel Vasquez Gilliland. It's been three years since ice raids and phone calls from Mexico and an ill-fated walk across the Sonoran. Three years since Sia Martinez's mom disappeared. Sia wants to move on, but it's hard in her tiny Arizona town where people refer to her mom's deportation as an unfortunate incident. Sia uncovers secrets as profound as they are dangerous in the stunning and inventive exploration of first love, family, immigration, and our vast, limitless universe. So I would not necessarily recommend reading the full synopsis before you read this if you want to be surprised. I left out parts of the synopsis in my little summary because they kind of spoil one of the most fun parts of the book, in my opinion, one of the most fun discoveries. I will say it is a really well done young adult novel. It definitely reads as young adult, so beware of that going into it if you are an adult like me. This was a very unique book and it explores a lot of serious and difficult subject matter. Grief, racism, immigration, and deportation, sexual assault, trauma, friendship, and coming of age, growing into adulthood, sexual discovery, all mixed with aliens, which <laughs> as a sci-fi nerd, I'm all for it. I really enjoyed Sia's character. I thought she was really well developed and had a very clear personality. And I liked how the novel explored her PTSD and showed her having a loving and consensual and caring relationship and support network to help her work through that trauma. 
I thought that was really beautifully done and I really appreciated that representation. I also was over the moon to see that this book included trigger warnings at the beginning. I had to stop and take a moment because I was taken aback by it in the best way. As you'll know, if you watch my bookish videos, I always do my best to include trigger warnings and content warnings for every book that I talk about on my channel. I think they are so important and I find it very upsetting to see the resistance within the publishing industry and even on booktube even amongst reviewers to embrace trigger and content warnings to support readers with trauma who want to be able to read stories without having their mental health severely negatively impacted to give back to readers the ability to make informed decisions about what we want to read and what we're willing and able to expose ourselves to at any given moment. Everyone has a right to read. Everyone should be able to enjoy reading stories without the fear of triggering severe trauma. Okay, anyway, I love that. That was really incredible to see. And I can only hope that this becomes standard. Really believe it's an accessibility issue and it is baffling that it is not treated as such. Okay, so that's not really about the book. <laughs> I will say I love the sci-fi element. It was really fun. I wish it had been further developed. It was uh, something that came in towards the end of the book and didn't really have a huge amount of time to be fully fleshed out. I understand why the beginning of the book had to be set up in the way that it did, but I do think the pacing was maybe a little uneven. But again, I'm a sci-fi nerd. Obviously, I'm going to <laughs> want more of the sci-fi element in anything I read. It's just, that's my personal preference. I think this is an important book for young people to be reading, teenagers to be reading. Whether this is something that they have personal experience with, whether this reflects their identity and their experience or not, I think it's important to read stories about people who are not like you. And I think, as we've seen recently, there are a lot of negative stereotypes around immigration and the idea of deportation. And I think it's really valuable for stories like this to be consumed by people who maybe don't know anyone personally who has immigrated or has had family who has been deported to further understand the situation, to be able to empathize with people who have a different life experience than them. Because honestly, seeing the kind of rhetoric that surrounds immigration and deportation is nauseating. I think it's disgusting how immigrants are spoken about and I think books like this are really going to pave the way to a new level of understanding in the next generation. And I think that is so incredibly valuable. The next book I finished in December was Ring Shout by P. Jelly Clark, a dark fantasy historical novella that gives a supernatural twist to the Ku Klux Klan's reign of terror. This book was incredible. Five stars, one of the most unique and horrifying horror novels that I read this year. It is so terrifying on so many different fronts, but also oddly fascinating. It's hard to describe. I will say this explores a lot of really intense subject matter. Do check trigger and content warnings for this one as well. This is reimagining the KKK as having actual monsters hidden as human monsters and kind of directing the hatred and the atrocities of the KKK through this sort of fantastical horror element. It's super short, very quick to get through, but it is really intense. It's a very powerful exploration of racism and oppression and the nature of hatred. It is, on the one hand, incredibly inventive and fascinating and thoughtful and vulnerable. And on the other hand, it is gut-wrenching and stomach-turning and horrifying and enraging and terrifying. This novella incorporates true American history with this fantastical horror element, and I think it's such a perfect melding of these two genres, and it is so incredibly effective at really driving home the terror and the just blind hatred and questioning where that comes from, really shining a light on the hatred and the vengeance and the fear and the suffering. It's really well written, but it is well written in a really gross way, which is perfect for horror. So it's going to stay with me for a really long time. I think this is a must read. Again, prepare yourself going into it. Read the trigger warnings, content warnings, determine if it's something that you can handle. But it was honestly 
just so masterfully done that I need to read anything that Clark ever writes. And it's really one of the most thought-provoking books that I read in 2020. The next book I read in December was The Invisible Life of Eddie LaRue by V.E. Schwab. A life no one will remember, a story you will never forget. France, 1714. In a moment of desperation, a young woman makes a Faustian bargain to live forever and is cursed to be forgotten by everyone she meets. Thus begins the extraordinary life of Addie LaRue and a dazzling adventure that will play out across centuries and continents, across history and art, as a young woman learns how far she will go to leave her mark on the world. This is a slow novel. <laughs> if you don't like slow novels with repetition and a lot of character development and not a huge amount of plot, you might not like this. But I really enjoyed this. I thought the writing was really beautiful. I thought the concept was really interesting. I love the idea of a deal with the devil. I loved how the devil was characterized in this novel. He was probably the most interesting character to me, or Henry. Henry was also a very interesting character. This book really asks what it means to have led a life well lived to make a mark on the world. What does it mean to be free? What is true freedom? How do we quantify the impact we've had on the world and on others? Doesn't matter if we're remembered. And this book doesn't answer those questions because the answers to those questions don't exist. There just is no answer. Q existential crisis number 508 of 2020. <laughs> No, I, I, I think this book might not be for a lot of people, but I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the prose. I liked jumping between different timelines. As I said, I really enjoyed the devil character. Henry's story had a lot of complexity to it that was really touching to me that, again, I would recommend checking out the trigger warnings, content warnings. I also really enjoyed that a lot of this book was centered on stories, storytelling, and art, artistic expression, the creation of specifically visual art and music. That was really nice to read as someone who myself is a very creative human in pretty much any possible way and a lover of stories and a lover of existential questions that don't really have an answer. This was right up my alley. I really enjoyed it. So if that appeals to you, check it out. If it sounds like something that is your worst nightmare, <laughs> then maybe skip this one. The next book I finished in December was Passing by Nella Larson. This book was originally published in 1929, but it is still incredibly relevant. Very short, a very quick read, but incredibly impactful. And this is the story of Claire, who is a light-skinned mixed-race woman who grew up in a Black neighborhood and with a Black community and ended up through a variety of circumstances marrying a white man who is overtly racist and doesn't know of her racial identity. And one day she runs into an old childhood friend, Irene, who is a light-skinned Black woman who has stayed in their Black community and married a Black man and had children. And Claire decides to rekindle their friendship and to reinsert herself into this Black community. And we follow what happens in that circumstance as she tries to reclaim that part of her identity while still hiding her identity from her racist husband and from her white society friends and her child. It's a really thought-provoking novel, and it asks some really interesting questions about racial identity and belonging and strict definitions of race and community. I'm going to read a quote from this book because I think it really demonstrates one of the core themes that this book is exploring, which is, it's funny about passing. We disapprove of it and at the same time condone it. It excites our contempt and yet we rather admire it. We shy away from it with an odd kind of revulsion, but we protect it. So this is a very quick read. It's incredibly thought-provoking and I highly recommend. The next book I finished in December was The Conductors by Nicole Glover, and this was another ARC that I received from NetGalley in exchange for an honest review. This hasn't been published yet. I will put the published date on the book card so that you can check that out. Hetty Rhodes is a magic user and former conductor on the Underground Railroad, who now solves crimes in post-Civil War Philadelphia. As a conductor, Hetty helped usher dozens of people north with her wits and magic. Now that the Civil War is over, she and her husband Benji have settled in Philadelphia, solving murders and mysteries that the white authorities won't touch. 
When they find one of their friends slain in an alley, Hetty and Benji bury the body and set off to find answers. But the secrets and intricate lies of the elites of Black Philadelphia only serve to dredge up more questions. To solve this mystery, they will have to face ugly truths all around them, including the ones about each other. So... I loved this. It took me a really long time. I think I officially started reading this book maybe back in July, and I had it in ebook form on my phone, which I have previously explained is my least favorite way to read books. So part of the reason why it took me so long to read this was because of the format. But another reason is that the beginning is a little bit slow, and there's a lot of kind of developing of the world. It is a fantasy version of our world where there's magic. So there's a bit of time to develop the magic system and develop the setting and introduce us to the characters. So I was having trouble getting through those first couple chapters. But once I got through the first, I don't know, maybe three chapters, I was really taken into this book. And from then on, I was just completely on board. I would describe this as a fantastical whodunit. There's magic and there's mystery. We need to figure out who the culprit is, but it also has a lot of heart and it has that emotional core and it explores some really important issues. It talks about slavery and oppression and racism. It mirrors some of the discussion from passing. There is a character who is passing for white in this story, and there's also some discussions of classism and the distinctions between different groups of Black Philadelphians based on their history, whether they were slaves or not, and also based on their wealth and their position within society. I loved Hetty, our protagonist. She was wonderful to spend a book with. She is incredibly smart and strong and caring while also being vulnerable and being willing to accept help and ask for help when she needs it and to lean on her support system, whether that be her husband or her friends, both in a personal and professional context. Benji was a little harder to wrap my head around, especially at the beginning because we don't get his perspective. But by the end of the book, I was in love with their dynamic. I ship them so hard. <laughs> They're adorable. I love them. I don't want to give anything away, so I won't. But let me just say, I got teary-eyed reading some of their interactions, especially near the end of the book. It is so sweet, and I love it. Uh, this book also has great representation. There is a trans man, and he is completely accepted by everyone around him. He is never misgendered. He is just accepted for who he is, and it's lovely to read. There is also a gay couple, two men who are in a relationship who are, again, completely accepted. There is no homophobia or transphobia in this book, which was just lovely to read about characters who could just be who they are without judgment and could just be part of this story. I feel like this book is a great example of what people are talking about when they say that historical fiction should be diverse, regardless of whether that is historically accurate or not. I think this book does it so well and just includes those people who did exist. There have been trans and gay people through all of history, and it's lovely to see them represented and to read about them as complex characters separate from their sexual or gender identity and to not see them being treated horribly for it, even if that would have been more accurate for how people would have been treated at the time. I thought the flashbacks to their time with the Underground Railroad were really interesting and obviously quite intense to read. This book explores quite a bit about slavery and oppression, even though that isn't the main focus of the sort of modern day timeline of the book. I also thought the magic system was really interesting. I've never read anything quite like it. It was very unique to me. I love that the magic was sort of anthropomorphized. It sort of had a personality of its own and the different types of magic had different types of personalities, and I really enjoyed that aspect of it as well. This was just a wonderful read. I really, really enjoyed it, and I think that fans of the fantasy genre are really going to like this one. The next book I finished in December was Les Fiancés de l'Hiver by Christelle Dambo, or A Winter's Promise in English. This was a French... Yes? <laughs> what? Yoda would like to say hi. Come here. Hello. Did you want to say hi in the first video of 2021? Hello, everybody. Did you like Les Fiancés de l'Eval? Est-ce que tu veux partager? I think she just wants me to hold her, but it's kind of hard to uh, <laughs> hold her like this while I talk about books. Here you go, honey. 
Yes. So this was a book I read in French, which is why it took me a long time. Um, this is the first time I've tried to read a fantasy novel in French, and boy, was it difficult um, for, you know, made-up things in fantasy. And also, I feel like a lot of fantasy tends to have sort of more flowery language, which is fine, except for the fact that some of these words I've never seen before in my life. I don't speak French on a regular basis these days, so it was a little bit <laughs> difficult. And that's definitely something to keep in mind in my review and rating of this is that I likely didn't get the full experience of this book because French is my second language. Long ago, following a cataclysm called the Rupture, the world was shattered into many floating celestial islands. Known now as arcs, each has developed in distinct ways. Each seems to possess its own unique relationship to time, such that nowadays vastly different worlds exist, together but apart. Ophelia lives on Anima, an arc where objects have souls. But Ophelia must leave her family behind and follow her new fiancé to the floating capital on the distant arc of the Pole. Though she doesn't know it yet, she has become a pawn in a deadly plot. So this one was fun. I feel like I probably missed <laughs> quite a bit of complexity and nuance in this one. I will say that I enjoyed it. I thought the magic systems were really interesting. I really enjoyed Ophelia's abilities, specifically the way she could read objects, as well as her traveling through mirrors. Very cool. And some of the other magic that we see once she gets to the pole, like the illusionists and the idea of creating entire environments or buildings or essentially an entire city within an illusion and sort of covering up all of the rotting corrupt underbelly with this beautiful, mild, weathered, filigreed, beautiful palaces and sort of living in denial of the actual darkness and unsavoriness of this place. I thought that was really interesting as well. I did find the characters a little bit two-dimensional for my taste. They weren't as well developed as I would have liked, though this is the first book in the series, so it's possible that they will be further developed moving forward. I did think there were some interesting characters, despite the fact that I wanted a little bit more as far as development, and I thought the plot was interesting. It wasn't anything particularly innovative, but it was enjoyable. So I gave it three stars. I think your mileage may vary <laughs> depending on your preferences when it comes to fantasy. And I have not read the translation, so I don't know what the English translation is like. If you're planning on reading it in English, I can't vouch for it because I don't know in what ways it's different. I can only speak for my <laughs> rusty French brain reading the French version. So that is what it is. I enjoyed it. I'm glad I finally finished it. I'm glad I put in the work. I'm, it was quite a challenge. And I do plan on reading the second, third, and fourth installments of this series. I would like to know what happens, but I can't promise when because it took me forever to read this book. And these are hefty. She's thick. Okay. So I don't know. I cannot promise when I'll read the other installments. I definitely want to, but it's quite a challenge. It's time consuming. And I stressed myself out by trying to read it as quickly as I read in English, which is just not ever going to be the case when it comes to reading in French. I finished it. <laughs> For everyone who's been waiting, I finished it. I liked it. Three stars. I enjoyed it. I do want to keep reading in the series. So thumbs up. The next book I read in December was To Be Taught If Fortunate by Becky Chambers. This was our book club pick for December for my Patreon book club. And I loved this. As an astronaut on an extrasolar research vessel, Ariadne and her fellow crewmates sleep between worlds and wake up each time with different features. Back on Earth, society changes dramatically from decade to decade, as it always does. But the moods of Earth have little bearing on their mission to explore, to study, and to send their learnings home. I love this so much. I give it five stars. As you'll know, if you've been watching my bookish videos this year, I discovered Becky Chambers this year. And she quickly became one of my favorite authors and certainly one of my favorite sci-fi authors that I've ever read. I love her work. I love her vision of the future. I love her take on sci-fi. She is very character-driven and science-based with so much diversity in characters, whether in this book specifically, it's diversity of human characters, but in some of her other books, it's diversity in characters, both human and alien. She has this wonderful ability to imagine these outlandish aliens that are just so fascinating to read about. And 
I love this so much. I felt that this had so much joy of discovery packed into the pages. It was fascinating and eye-opening and beautiful and also painful and heartbreaking at times. There's queer representation and trans representation and asexual representation as well as implied polyamory. There is pain and suffering and sacrifice, but there's also this pure joy of scientific discovery for discovery's sake of teamwork and of a shared purpose that is really beautiful. This gave me very Star Trek vibes. It's very science heavy. And it also asks some really interesting moral and ethical questions about space travel and scientific exploration, which I thought were just very, very interesting to think about alone and also to discuss in our book club. We had such an interesting discussion about this book and I would highly recommend it to sci-fi nerds everywhere. <laughs> the next book I read in December was A Lat's Way by Darcy Little Badger. Imagine an America very similar to our own. It's got homework, best friends, and pistachio ice cream. But there are some differences. This America has been shaped dramatically by the magic, monsters, knowledge, and legends of its peoples, those indigenous and those not. Alatsue lives in a slightly stranger America. She can raise the ghosts of dead animals, a skill passed through generations of her Lipin Apache family. Her beloved cousin has just been murdered in a town that wants no prying eyes. But she is going to do more than pry. The picture-perfect facade of Willoughby masks gruesome secrets, and she will rely on her wits, skills, and friends to tear off the mask and protect her family. I love this. I will say it's a young adult, but it does read quite young, sort of similar to Sia Martinez. It kind of reads between middle grade and young adult, but the protagonists are meant to be 17, so there's a little bit of a disjointedness there that some reviewers have commented on, and I understand that. But I thought this was beautiful. There is lovely representation here. Our main character is Lipin Apache, and there's a lot of exploration of their traditions and beliefs in this novel that are really beautiful to read about. She's also asexual and potentially also aromantic, so that's some nice representation there as well. And the story itself not only has this sort of mystery aspect that is really interesting and the fantastical element of magic and the ability Ability to raise ghosts. I think the way that the ghost world, the underworld, and also the raising of ghosts and the stories of Alatsue's sixth great-grandmother were really fascinating, one of my favorite parts of this book. But there's also some really subtle commentary on racism and colonialism, the treatment of indigenous peoples in North America that I also thought was very poignant and important. Just overall, I thought this was a really beautiful story. It made me feel things. Um, it was really interesting and heartfelt and surprising and and joyful, and I just thought it was lovely. And the very last book I read in December, I can't believe we've gotten here. <laughs> this is gonna be a long video, I already know it, is The Obelisk Gate by N.K. Jemisin. This is the way the world ends for the last time. The season of endings grows darker as civilization fades into the long cold night. It continues with a lost daughter found by the enemy. It continues with the obelisks, and an ancient mystery converging on answers at last. The stillness is the wall which stands against the flow of tradition, the spark of hope long buried under the thickening ashfall, and it will not be broken. This is the second book in the Broken Earth trilogy. I read the first book last month? Is it last month? Time has no meaning. And I loved it. One of my favorite books of the year, if not possibly my favorite book of the year, you'll have to watch my next video where I rank my 10 favorite books from number 10 to number one <laughs> to know where it lands, if it lands at all. Uh, it does. It does. It's one of my favorite books of the year. Just fantastic. So well done. It's kind of hard to talk about sequels in a series because I don't want to give anything away about the first book. And it's kind of hard to talk about the second book without giving away things about the first book because it obviously picks up where the first book left off. So I can't say a lot of details, but I will say that I loved it just as much as the first. I am very happy that I started reading this trilogy this year. I cannot wait to read the third book in 2021. It's just so heartbreaking and so fascinating and unique and complex. And it just gets me like, it, I don't know how to describe it in a better way. It just does it for me. It's a lovely series so far. It has so much to give and it is so worth your time. So please, if you haven't already and you love fantasy, please start reading this series because you will not regret it. Well, some people don't like it. I, I can't guarantee that there are some people who don't like this series somehow. Don't ask me how. I cannot guarantee you'll love it as much as I do, but 
if you tend to like the same books that I do, if we read some of the same ones and we had similar thoughts, read the series. It is well worth your time. So those are all the books I read in December. And now we're going to quickly touch on my plan for reading in January. So for my January TBR, I'm not going to go through each book individually as I have in the past, because for January, my plan is to read as many of the Goodreads Choice Award winners of 2020 as I can. So what I'll do instead of going through each book individually is leave the link down below to the page where you can see all the winners by genre or by category, I suppose. And there you'll be able to see all of the winners. And those are all the books that I am hoping to read in January. I'm sure I won't be able to read every single one. And there are a couple that I'm probably not going to get to, such as the winner for graphic novel, because it's the third in a series. I don't know if I'll be able to get my hands on and read the first two as well as the third in the series. There are also a couple that just do not appeal to me whatsoever. So I'll probably leave those to the end. And if I don't get to them, then I don't get to them. <laughs> But I'm going to do my best to read as many of them as I can. I've already finished a couple and started a couple, and I think it's going to be a fun challenge to see how many I can read and also to see my general thoughts on the winners and if I kind of align with the general consensus, which seems to be that they are widely loved. And also our book club selection for January is one of those winners, and that is The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. It was the fiction winner, and I am about three quarters of the way through, I believe, and I'm really, really enjoying it. So those are my plans for January. I'm very excited. Make sure to come back here at the start of February to hear my thoughts on all the Goodreads choice winners of 2020. It should be interesting. Thank you for watching this video. I'm sure it was very long. I appreciate you watching all the way to the end. If you did get all the way to the end, please leave some sort of book emoji in the comments so that I know that you're a real one. And as always, please let me know what you're reading right now. What are your plans for January? What great books have you finished lately? I want to hear it. Let me know. Thank you so much for watching my first video of 2021, and I'll see you very soon in my next one. Bye, friends. Before I go, I want to take a moment to thank my patrons for their support, especially all the patrons we picked up during Plantmas. This is so exciting. There are so many new faces and names. Without further ado, thank you to our newest patrons. Emerald Took Cosplay, Carla, Sophie, Sahana, Sharifa, Plan with April, Elizabeth, Alex, Emily, Hannah, Rita, Gabriella, Lauren, Jody, Caitlin, Ellen, Katrina, Elizabeth, Ricky, Erica, Jessica, Caitlin, Neo, Liz, Natalie, Nicole, Sarah, Jenny Hawk, Katie, Gianna, Mai, Caitlin, Angel, Sigrid, Christina, Maddie, Gloria, Verena, Sin, Mackenzie, Small Crazy, Brinley, Mariah, Michelle, Karen, Sierra, Brandy, Belinda, Isa, Chelsea, Patricia, Kelly, Stacy, Miss Fan, Noor, Emily, Elitarasu, Colette, Maija, Jackie, Joanna, Kat, Maggie, Revian, Marilee, Tree, Sonia, Nicole, Harriet, Nicole, Keith, Katie, Mallory, Masha, Hannah, Kim, Kari, Carrie, Annie, and Beth. Whew. Welcome all of you to the squad. We are so, so excited to have you. If you at home want to join the squad, feel free. There's a link in the card and in the description box down below. Whew. Bye, friends.